I'm going to be recording this session. Um, just, just so you'll know, your comments will be recorded as well. The first thing I want to emphasize tonight is the fact that Jesus actually and literally died. As we say in the South, he was dead. While he was supposed to be dead, he was not on some preaching crusade. Paul said Messiah died for our sins, just as the scripture said in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. I, I really like that. He was buried, he further said, and he was raised from the dead. And he was raised from the dead because he was dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. This letter was written by Paul after Jesus' resurrection, actually probably around 53 to 54 uh, AD. And it was written at Ephesus in Asia Minor. After Jesus' resurrection, he was visibly seen by Peter, by the 12. And after that, Paul said, I'm, I'm looking at 1 Corinthians 15. I know there was others. But Paul said he was seen by more than 500 brothers. We, we think of those as just being ordinary individuals, but they were A-D-E-L-P-H-O-I-S. And that, to me, says they were brothers in Christ. Uh, that were, he, Jesus was seen after his resurrection. Now, we have no record other than this that I know of where Jesus was seen and and with 500 people at one time. Most of those 500, Paul said, were still alive at, at his writing in, in Corinthians 15. But some, he said, have fallen asleep, which is the biblical way of saying they were dead. Jesus used this when he told the disciples about Lazarus in John 11, who Jesus said was asleep, but he was going to wake him up. Jesus clarified when they saw that they didn't understand what he was saying. So he clarified that statement to the disciples by simply saying, Lazarus is dead. As further proof that Jesus was alive, Paul said, I saw him. I like that. Last of all, I saw him. Jesus testified in Revelation 1, 1.18, I was dead. Now, you can read that and say, well, Jesus said I was dead. Or you can say Jesus meant to say, and what we need to hear Jesus say is, I was dead. He claimed to be the living one, which is what the two men who terrified Mary Magdalene and the other Mary on the first day of the week at early dawn uh, by their sudden appearance and dazzling clothing, as you might well imagine, asking them why they were seeking for the living one among the dead, Luke 24, 1 through 5. Um, I, I put this up because I want you to look at that. Peter, and let me get out of it so you can kind of absorb it while I talk just a little bit. I'll give you a chance to, to think about it, to sing. Peter, in his message to the men of Israel on the day of Pentecost, pointed out that Jesus... The Nazarene uh, was a man, a man, wonder why he said he was a man. Do you suppose that Peter knew that he was a man? Wow. You know, people today, I've heard it said, Jesus was the man, but he was not a man. Well, Peter didn't get that message. That wasn't what Peter knew. He said, Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man through whom God had done miracles, wonders, signs in the midst, in their midst, the people he's talking to, and that they fell, full well knew that Jesus had done those things. And Peter boldly proclaimed that godless men nailed this man, Jesus, to a cross and put him to death in Acts 2, 22 to 23. Jesus assures us in Revelation 1, 18, I was dead. I didn't just appear to be dead. I was dead. He did not swoon his death as, as the story went out. Listen to this. Uh, this is written by Eric Manning, the New Testament history enthusiast. He said, the swoon theory is the idea that Jesus faked his death on the cross. He just appeared to have died. 
This theory was popular in the 18th and 19th century among German rationalists. Only a handful of scholars who believe the swoon theory is alive today and um, hold to this option. John claimed to be an eyewitness. He claimed to have seen blood and water come from Jesus' pierced heart, John 19, 34 through 35. This shows that Jesus' lungs had collapsed and he had died of his asphyxiation. It's a medically confirmed fact that we know today. Um, a half dead Jesus wouldn't be able to convince anyone that he was the resurrected Lord of glory. Some refer to others that came down from the cross and were taken down from the cross and, and lived for a short while. I think one fellow lived for a while, but uh, that didn't happen. Jesus would have been a half dead Jesus, and he couldn't have convinced anybody of anything. Remember this Pastor John Stott said, are we to believe, <laughs> this is good, listen, to believe that after the rigors and pains of the trial, the mockery, the flogging, the crucifixion, he could survive those hours in a stone sepulcher with neither warmth nor food nor medical care, that he could then rally sufficiently to perform the superhuman feat of shifting the boulder which secured the mouth of the tomb. That don't make any sense, does it? But yet some, it don't have to make sense for some people to hold to it, does it? Um, okay. Um, I, I just put that up there so you could look at it where it talks about Jesus' blood, his, where he bled and mentioned in the Bible. And I, I think it's interesting to think about. Any comments before I go on? Good. God raised him up. Acts 2.24. We're still listening to Peter's sermon. Loosing the pangs of death because it, it was not possible for him to be held by it. Why was it not possible? Because God ordained that Jesus should be raised. And when God does that, just get out of his way because it's going to happen. Um, Peter said, but Peter said, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. That's Acts 2.24, another translation, NASB. Peter appealed to David's writings in Psalm 16, 8 through 11, where David prophesied of the coming Messiah, who David said his soul was not left in the grave. His flesh would not see corruption. What does that mean? Somebody help me out. What does it mean? His soul was not left in the grave. His flesh did not see corruption. Tell me what that means. Jesus was not left in the grave. The Jesus that was buried was not left in the grave. Okay. And, and he did not seek, he did not begin to deteriorate or de decay. Uh, God raised him up before that took place. Okay. And God ordained that on uh, the third day, he would raise him up and he would not see corruption. His flesh would not corrupt. That's the general run of things, isn't it? For a person's flesh. Uh, I guess immediately after uh, death, the flesh begins to, to some degree, to change, to decay. And Peter assures us that David's prophecy about the coming Messiah that Peter referred to in Psalm 16, 8 through 11, Peter made it very plain. He made it very, very plain. Matter of fact, he come right, right out and said, David didn't go to heaven. I mean, there was how many sermons or preached about David playing his heart for God or for Jesus. It didn't happen. Not while, not while he was dead, but that in Psalm 16, uh, David was saying he was prophesying about the coming Messiah, Jesus. 
And David seemed excited about it, <laughs> about this hope. He confessed that because of his, this Messiah, uh, whose flesh would, that hit because of this, because his, the flesh of this Messiah would not see corruption. David was saying, my flesh will rest then in hope. He knew what was going to happen to him. God told him, when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. What God told him was going to happen. He knew his flesh then would, at some point, live in hope. And now would live in hope of the, that time to come when his flesh would be raised from the dead. And he praised God for this hope. For through it, God had made known to David the ways of life even the more abundant life that Jesus talked about in John 10, 10, that we praise God today also because of this promise of abundant life, which was brought to light in the gospel of the kingdom. And Paul reminded Timothy in some of his final written words of our holy calling is what Paul called it to Timothy, revealed by the appearing of Jesus who brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, in what way was the, and what way was life and immortality brought to light through the gospel? How did the gospel do that? Uh, the words of Jesus. Okay. And what were you remember any of those words? What they might be. That they, that may, that they may know they the only true God. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast seen. Mm -hmm. And one of the and and when when some of the disciples had or, or some had, had went away, uh, he turned around and asked his disciples, said, Will you also go away? And Peter said, Well, Lord, to, to whom can we go to? You have the words of eternal life. Yeah. You got the words. It's like going to the doctor and he's saying, you need this shot and I've got it. And uh, you say, no, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to get out of here. And uh, rather than saying, why do I want to get out of here? You've got, you've got the shot that I need. Why would I want to get out of here? And so um, that's, that's what had happened uh, to, and those were, you know, those that left Jesus. I think if I'm not mistaken, they were called disciples. So, you know, disciples don't always hang with it, do they? They don't always stay with it. Did Israel stay with it? No. Why didn't they, do you think? Well, they knew more. They knew more. Yeah. Just like people do today. Hey, they know more than God. You remember the the, the uh, talk about the the uh, Israelites in the wilderness. It says in their heart they turn back into into Egypt. Uh, they got to remembering all of the nice meals that they had. They didn't forgot about all all those uh, terrible atrocities that were uh, heaped upon them by the Egyptians. They forgot about that. All they could think about was, I guess, filling their belly. That is kind of important, but it shouldn't be the most important thing, should it? But it is sometimes sad to say. Another, another thing is the fact that, uh, you know, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, and that gospel includes the fact that God's kingdom is going to uh, be put here on the earth. And what good is that kingdom if we're not alive to enjoy it? Right. Yes, sir. This common sense tells you you need to be alive in order to enjoy God's kingdom and mm -hmm. participate in God's kingdom. And that's the amazing thing is Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In other words, he opened people's eyes to these possibilities and that God was making available to them. And God makes available to us these same glorious wonderful promises and we've got the gospel too and we can hear it believe it respond to it live it just like he said and to those uh paul said in romans 
who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. So we need to be seeking for glory and honor and immortality so that we might gain eternal life. You remember, was who was it said one time, um, said Jesus talked a lot of some about uh, the um, problems they were going to have when they ministered to people and preached the gospel. And uh, he talked to them about it. And um, he went on and said, um, one of the disciples says, well, now look, we've left our jobs, you know, fishing and whatever. And Matthew left his tax collecting. All people left different things. He said, what do we get out of it? And he said, you that have followed me in the regeneration, when the son of man shall sit on the throne of his glory, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So What's it? There's something, men, there is something. I want you to look me in the eye when I say that. There is something in this for you and me. God has put it that way. He has said it that way. He wants us to know if you will listen to my words, listen carefully, and those are, that's one of the most important things, and believe those things and live by those things. I've got something you can have. And actually, it's something I want. <laughs> and it's something I know that you want. We want its eternal life to live without dying. Wow. That's a concept. <laughs> which, Apostle which, Paul, go ahead. Apostle Paul said that in talking to the people on Mars Hill, that he said, and God has given us assurance of all this in that he raised Jesus from the dead. The yeah. fact that Jesus now lives is the assurance that we also can live. Well, he said, because I live, but even before he died, because I live, you shall live also. And yeah. I think it was looking forward to the fact that he knew he was going to die. And he said, because I live, you shall live also. L listen to what Jesus said in John 17 and 17. Sanctify them in the the truth. Your word is truth. If truth wasn't important, he wouldn't have said that. And uh, as you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And then here's the clicker. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for for those also who believe in me through their word. Yeah. Now that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I believe on him through some words that some people talk, talk to me about some <laughs> 60, 60 some years ago. I believed in those words myself. Actually, I was 11 years old and I'm 76 now. So that was 65 years ago. And, and, I, and it's the same words that, that, that I just got through reading. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way I believed it. It's the gospel. Gospel of the kingdom. The, the very thing that the sower went forth to sow. He sowed the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he said it was. I want to rehearse something for you here now. I know you can read it in, um, I think, in John 20, I think it is. Um, I want to paraphrase it just a bit. In the evening of the first day of the week in which Jesus was resurrected. Let me get out of here. I want you to get right into this. As the disciples were hiding for fear of the Jews, that's what they were doing. Jesus stood in their midst. He showed them his hands and his side. Convincing proof to them would have been to me that this was indeed their Messiah who had been crucified, who had died, who had been buried, and truly God had raised from the dead. One of the 12 named Thomas called Didymus was not with the disciples when Jesus came that time. When they said to him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. 
He wasn't convinced. Not me, he said. Unless I see his hand in his hands, the imprint of the nails, put my finger into the place of the nails, put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe. Well, eight days later, the disciples were there again, hiding again, I guess. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors again were shut, but Jesus stood in their midst, singled out Thomas and said to him, reach here with your finger, Thomas, see my hands, reach here your hand and put it into my side. He invited him to not be unbelieving, but to believe. It was a wonderful event that happened there. Um, let's go just a little bit further. Just before the feast of the Passover, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. We're going back up a little bit, back up to just before the feast of Passover. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He became troubled at the meeting as he realized that one of the 12 would betray him. To Judas, he said, what you do, do quickly. Jesus had told the 12 that he was going away. And that where he was going, they couldn't come. Peter pushed him on this subject. Lord, where are you going? Peter declared his allegiance to Jesus, but Jesus knew that he would deny him three times before the cock crowed, and he told him as much. Thomas entered the conversation by asking, now this is before, remember, by asking Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How, how can we know the way? And just a little bit later, Philip asked, joined in the conversation, Lord, just show us the Father. That's enough. And Jesus said to them, he who has seen me has seen the Father. What did he mean? Believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. That's in John 14. After you let that conversation in which Thomas was involved sink in, remember, show us the father. Thomas was in that conversation. Show us the father. And that's, a, that's all we need. That's what Philip asked. Just show us. Well, while we let that sink in, let's go back to chapter 20. Go up to chapter 20 where Jesus invites Thomas to not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas finally gets what Jesus meant earlier when Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. I believe that's why Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He finally got it after all that. His learning curve kicked in. He was not calling Jesus his God. Jesus made it very plain in verse 17 of the 20th chapter of John in a conversation with Mary. I ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. He made very plain who his God was. Thomas didn't have to be uh, uh, martyred because he said that. My Lord, my God. Always be sure to remember, and I'm sure you will, these words of the apostle Paul. Yet for us, there's but one God. And that one God is the father. You wanna know who the one God is? It's the father, not the son. He's not, the, he's not God, he's the son of God. Yet for us, there is but one God. Though Paul said in the previous verse, verse five, though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. The make a difference who you call God. There is but one God. Remember this. 
Don't ever forget it. Calling someone God does not make him or her God. There's only one of them for us, and Jesus ain't one of them. He is the Father. You can call him as Thomas got kind of excited and recognized Jesus and saw the Father, that he was in the Father, and the Father was in him. He looked at it, and his eyes were open, and he saw it, and he believed. But remember, calling someone God, Pharaoh was called God. Come on. God told yeah. Moses that was going to happen. That's, that's what is going to happen. The judges were called gods uh, in, in the Old Testament. But calling someone God does not make him or her God. There's only one of them. And I'm not one of them. And you're not one of them. And Jesus is not one of them because he's a man. He's a man. Yes, he is the man, and he is a man. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any, any comments? I'm going to go vary just a little bit on this uh, uh, subject before we go any further. All right. If you don't have anything to say, uh, Paul said in First Corinthians fifteen twelve. Now is Christ. Now, if Christ is preached, and he was being preached, that he has been raised from the dead, just like uh, 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 Pastor Michael did this morning. How does some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, don't, don't jump by that too quickly. There were evidently in the Corinthian church some who did not believe in a future resurrection of the dead. In the church. That's the way it is, you know. That's the way it is with the Corinthian brethren. Often the converted person does not abandon some of those things he used to believe, which need to be replaced with the truth. You know it, and I know it. People come to church with a lot of baggage, and we have to help them, just like um, uh, the brother was, was it Apollos that was helped and taken aside and explained the word of uh, the Lord more, more fully to them. They needed a little help in their understanding. And that's why you still hear people in the churches of God talk about what they're going to do when they get to heaven. You still do. And it really bothers me, but don't get too excited, men. <laughs> Things you have been brought up with are difficult to get rid of, aren't they? Things you have believed since you were, oh, young. <laughs> are hard to get rid of. Listen, we used to watch TV, uh, cartoons. Cartoons weren't like they are nowadays. But you remember the cartoons when the cat died, one of his souls went out. <laughs> he had nine, by the way. And then another one went out. And then another one went out. Another one went out until nine had left that poor old cat. I don't know how he carried them all his life. And then you see that you saw it over and over and over. It's being fortified. It has been, and it's hard to get rid of. It's hard for people to get rid of. A little research will help us to see these folks might have been. Um, who these folks that Paul said some, Christ has been preached. He has been preached and he rose from the dead. Some of the Corinthians, in the Corinthian church evidently, were saying, no, there ain't no resurrection of the dead. Okay, you say, well, how can we? Know? Listen, men, you know this. Mark 12, 18. Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him. So doesn't it sound, make sense that either they were taught by a Sadducee or they were formerly a Sadducee, came to the Corinthian church, got excited about the resurrected Messiah, 
but no, yeah, he was resurrected, but no, there is not going to be a resurrection of the dead. Why did they say that? That's what they'd been taught all their lives. <laughs> and that's what they saw. Matthew, that was Mark's quotation. Matthew said the same thing. On that day, some Sadducees, you know, they, they didn't believe in a resurrection, so they were sad, you see. You got that? They were Sadducees. They were sad, you see. On that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, Matthew 22, 23. And Luke, in chapter 20, verse 27, 28, now there came to him some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection, and they questioned him. And then Luke recorded these words from Acts 23, verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So people come with a lot of baggage, hard to get rid of. Some never do. And they think in those terms right on and on. Sad to say that's the way it is, but that's the way it is. Another thing you have to remember about the Corinthians, uh, they were indoctrinated in the Grecian uh, philosophy of uh, Plato and Socrates. Yes. And uh, there was no need for a resurrection. Yes. Because they went on to glory whenever they died. Yeah. And I, I think that that was probably play, played in their uh, ideal of there being no resurrection. Of the dead. That's the other side of the coin, Paul, that I was going to get into also. And I'm glad you brought it up because we'll go ahead and look at it is uh, the fact that um, some people don't, like the Sadducees, didn't believe that there would be a resurrection for whatever reason. And some people today are sad, you see, because they don't see the need for a resurrection. Exactly. Uh, it, it, there is, if the dead rise not, we're in trouble. Because there's no future life without a resurrection. There is no. Amen. Jesus said, Jesus put it plain. I am the resurrection and the life. So there you go. There is no future life without a resurrection. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Matthew said that while John the Baptist was baptizing in the river Jordan, all Jerusalem, Judea, and all the district around Jordan were going out to him, confessing their sins. When John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he rebuked them, suggesting that they first bring forth fruits in keeping with their penance, which they evidently were not doing. So it seems that some Sadducees were stirred to at least go out and see what was going on. What appeals to the masses often demands at least a look-see, doesn't it? It could have been that the teaching of the Sadducees was in some ways appealing to even those in Corinth who could have been Jews or not. At any rate, there were those in the Corinthian church who were saying, there's no resurrection of the dead. What do you believe that for? There's no resurrection of the dead. Uh, I, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't, um, let's, let's, let, me, let me go to this next slide. Let me get out of here so you can see it. Okay, I get, that gets me out of it. Paul said, in effect, in 1 Corinthians 15, those that said uh, there's no resurrection of the dead. In effect, Paul said, listen, folks, that won't work. How can you say that given the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead, how can you say that there's no resurrection of the dead because Christ has been raised from the dead? He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Wow, <laughs> wonder what those Sadducee type people thought about that, which uh, further means, Paul said, by the way, our preaching is in vain, and so is your faith, and we stand accused of being false witnesses of God because we testified concerning God that he raised Christ from the dead, who he didn't raise if the dead are not raised. So on this day when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. 
we too celebrate the resurrection of the believers, right? Hey, hey, Dennis, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about how black that picture was that Paul gave us in, in the 17th verse? I mean, that is just as dark and as, as gloomy as it can get that if Christ had not been raised from the dead, there would be absolutely no hope of any kind. I mean, bury our loved ones, eat, live, and be merry, and tomorrow we die, and that, that's it. No future, none whatsoever. What a dark picture that is. So we celebrate today <laughs> the resurrection of the believer because of the resurrection of Jesus, because Amen. they are, let me, let me do it, let it this way. I think I've done it this way before, but I want to do it again. Those two ideas are like that. They won't separate. You can't have one without the other. People say, I believe that Jesus raised from the dead, but I don't see any need for the righteous being resurrected because they go on to the reward when they die. But won't work, won't work. You got to get won't back work. to that. That's the yeah. only way it'll work. Yeah. yeah. You know, the worst thing about this false theory, you are yet in your sins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to live with that the rest of your life. No. And that's not even the worst. Go out to the graveyard. Take a look at those headstones. You see some of your folks in there. You see a headstone for your mom, your dad. You see a headstone for a loved one, a wife, maybe a husband. You see that those people have fallen asleep in Christ. They perished. They're gone. Forget about them. Go on to your business. Don't think That's about it Paul anymore. It. That's why Paul said in first Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life we have only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men, most miserable. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And I like the, the NASB, it says most to be pitied. <laughs> uh, uh, people look at us and, and say, well, look, they believe in the resurrection of Christ, but they don't believe in the resurrection because there's no need for it. Uh, pity those folks. Without a future resurrection, there is no future life beyond the grave. And those who have fallen asleep and hey, listen, one of these days, that's going to be you and it's going to be me. We talk about those who have fallen asleep in death. That's one of them is going to be me and one of them is going to be you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what would we have without the resurrection of Jesus who assures us as Paul read assures us of a future resurrection of the dead. God, Proved. I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do, and I'll yeah, show you why. Me. I'll show yeah. you why I'm going to do it because, and by raising my own son up out of the grave. Yeah. Wait till you get to the sunshine. The, the, the next verse that you go up there, just like a blast of sunshine. I mean, it just brightens the whole picture. Right. Brightens the whole picture. Now, look at this, guys. I like Peter's comments on this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope or a hope of living again, either way you want to look at it. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Yeah. That's... Yeah. That's what it's about here on this, to me at least, on this Resurrection Sunday. As a matter of fact, um, you know, the early church began meeting on the first day of the week, as I understand Acts, and um, they began uh, meeting on the first day of the week. And, um, you know, it continues to be Resurrection Sunday, don't you think? Resurrection yeah. Sunday. So uh, when, you, when you talk about Sunday, uh, from now on, talk about Resurrection Sunday, and that, that makes it even more special uh, to us, and, and makes us remember 
uh, that, uh, and praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When Jesus was raised on the third day, just like the scriptures said he would be, when he was raised the third day, that leaves Dennis, James, Paul, and Wade with a living, living hope. Amen. And that's the hope, men, that's the hope I want to hang on to. It's worth hanging no on to. No wonder that David said, my flesh shall rest in hope. Yes. Because thou wilt not leave. Now he's talking about Jesus, but he was, Jesus, I think right. he was talking about himself too. Thou wilt not leave yeah. my soul in hell. <laughs> in the grave. You know, the King James says in hell, but actually he's talking about the grave. Neither will you suffer your holy one to see corruption. And um, that's our hope on this resurrection Sunday. I hope, uh, I hope that brings a, a thread of joy to you as we finish out this day and begin uh, our new week here uh, studying about uh, the Lord. Any other thoughts or comments? It's open to you guys. We'll talk as long as you want to. <laughs> Dennis, I don't know how other people feel. This message of a resurrection, of Jesus coming, of a, of a real kingdom to be established. It thrills my soul every single morning that I wake up. I, I, it, it's, it's so refreshing, you know. It, it, it never gets boring, you know. It's, it's, it's refreshing. It just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> that explains it pretty good. <laughs> It just does something to me that I can't. See. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It lights my fire. Don't say that around Wade because he likes to light fires. So, <laughs> well, there again, it just said, like, like David said, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiced. Oh, wow. We rejoice <laughs> that we have a glorious hope of one day living again, even yeah. as Christ lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop this recording and then we'll...